First speaker is Howell Rowans from the city of Burundara. Howell is responsible for the Tri Walking Principal Pedestrian Network Demonstration Project in Camberwell. He'll outline the inf infrastructure and targeted behaviour change campaign that uh, increased walking participation and reduced car use. He is an experienced international transport strategist researcher. The Tri Walking Project won the IGS Sustainable Transport Award in. 2014, please welcome Highwall. Uh, for those who don't know, Campbell is about 8 kilometres east of uh, Melbourne CBD. There's about 8,000 people employed there, and uh, it's mainly a retail and kind of employment uh, offer that, that, that's there, plus kind of leisure and services. Um, that's what it is. Um, the aims of the project were really to kind of increase walking participation, but also to try and influence a, a mode shift away from the car use for the immediate community. Uh, but it was also, in terms of objectives, also to trial a methodology developed by the state government and to um, uh, deliver uh, infrastructure and uh, a uh, behaviour change programme. Um, this just gives you a very broad outline of what the project uh, was doing um, from a very uh, strategic foundation and starting point, and that was mainly the modelling, uh, to research components and then the design and delivery of the project and eventually the evaluation. But the evaluation, we really thought about that from the onset in terms of when we were um, uh, uh, setting up the aims in terms of what we could actually measure, how we could actually measure that and what we needed to measure. Uh, this is the modelling. Uh, what it essentially does, it, um, it actually maps every individual within the surrounding com community for a distance of about a kilometre and then aggregates all those lines, the shortest paths, um, uh, in terms of uh, the most uh, direct route for members of the community. Um, and then we went out and kind of walked those routes. Uh, what we also did as well was um, we did a, a lot of pedestrian camps in, in the centre uh, and those camps actually created a cordon around the outside of the centre, outside the main car parking areas. That's not to say that some people didn't park kind of outside those areas and walk in, but they'd be walking a bit of a distance uh, to come into the centre. Um, oh, yeah, we, we um, around that cordon, Autumn, we actually had about 15,000 trips, uh, uh, pedestrian trips coming in and out to that cordon each day. And I think the value of that is understanding kind of the sheer volume of pedestrian movement that occurs there. And you don't really see, you see 15,000 cars, they make a lot of noise, they smell a lot, um, and uh, they're very visual, but you don't see so much kind of 15,000 people moving. Uh, one of the first things we did with that information was actually compare um, the, the number of people that the model was saying should be walking along these corridors and uh, the number of walking trips which are actually occurring there. Now they're not directly comparable. You're not expecting what you get from um, the model to represent what your, uh, um, the actual numbers that you're counting. What it does do is it tells you which corridor is actually relatively low in comparison to the population that lives out in that direction. And then you can sort of create these factors and just see which ones are lower than others and therefore is there some big latent demand that you can tap into if you deliver improvements and you encourage people to move. Uh, we also went uh, and did questionnaire surveys at the heart of the centre asking people how they got there, how much they spent, why they travelled there. About 20% of people who had actually walked in, um, and then the remaining came by train, train about half came in by car. But we also asked people, could they have uh, used another mode of transport that day than um, what they'd actually used? And about 20% of the motorists actually indicated, yes, I could have actually walked that day, or I could have used the tram that day. Likewise, with the tram, uh, about 20% indicated they could have walked rather than jump on the tram. So when we do all the maths about this, uh, we basically come out with about a 32% mode share. That's the potential uh, 
from that simple survey. So there's a good over 50 percent increase uh, that can actually happen there. Um, in terms of the value of pedestrians, they visit the most often, and over a period of the year, if you sort of do the sums, they actually spend the most in the centre. So they they're really valuable um, individuals to look after in terms of the, uh, kind of the, the retail of the centre. Um, the next thing we did was really look at, into the research of how do we actually encourage people to walk. Um, you know, we, we actually put aside a lot of the good practice notes that you see kind of floating around and we went back to academia and looked at studies that said, well, in this strait, we delivered trees, and the trees resulted in an X number of things, extra people walking. So we went back and looked at um, different uh, measures we could introduce, and also uh, the same goes with um, sort of behavior initiatives, what was actually working in different environments. So um, our modeling and our audits uh, flagged that there were two corridors had the potential to increase walking participation, but also had the potential to actually improve. And I'll talk about Cookson Street uh, to start with. Uh, it connects all the right places, uh, your train stations, the shops, schools, park, etc. So why didn't we see more people kind of walking along that corridor? Um, mainly because a lot of the desire lines where people actually wanted to walk, and it could be a matter of just the other side of the road, they were poorly catered for. So a lot of people walked on the south side of Cookson Street, a very narrow path, um, and that path ran out or me meandered all over the place. And what we did, we brought in sort of a new path, a wide path. We chose a 2.5 meter path. The reason being, you can walk side by side comfortably, have a chat, and someone can pass the other way. There's no need to sort of drop in single file. It, it becomes a lot more of a comfortable environment. Um, when we first went out to, some, to design, we flicked it out to design us a footpath along here. They put a footpath in on, on, on the uh, drawings and took out every tree down the entire road. And this is, the, the trees are a real asset to that environment. I mean, there's a beautiful tree there. What if we ripped that out? It wouldn't have looked the same, it wouldn't have the character. So we really maintained as much of the character that was of value along there as we could, and we worked around that. Um, likewise, there were um, telegraph poles there. They, t they cost ten to thirty thousand to sort of move around, but we can better spend that money elsewhere. People aren't going to change their travel habits just because you've moved a telegraph pole. Um, and then, kind of further along, um, the path just ran out, and people typically took the shortest route and kind of walked around the road, as you see <coughs> here. Um, and most of the cars trapped well outside that area, so it was kind of wasted space. We had to be a bit careful here because there are train replacement services, bus services that come around here periodically, so we had to make sure that they could still navigate the street. So just to take you through on a, a little journey through that path, you can see the two and a half metre path all the way along here. All this path didn't exist previously, we kept going. We worked around those telegraph poles and parking meters, we kept as much of the tree assets as we could in existing landscaping, and we supplemented that landscaping to improve it. Um, and that takes you into Campbell Station. The corridor itself actually goes out much further than that. We actually <coughs> pushed those corridors out to about 1.2 kilometers and delivered improvements along the entire length. So it was things like lighting and regular seating and landscaping. We did that all the way, a, a whole of corridor approach. Um, so this was another <coughs> section of it, um, but we didn't, um, we didn't do this where it is. It's a challenge um, because you've got about 2,000 cars that uh, kind of head north and south of this corridor in a peak hour. It's a car every two seconds. To cross each arm of this, one of these kind of, um, uh, to cross each arm here, you need four seconds as a pedestrian to do it comfortably on each arm. You've got two seconds to do it. So what you see up there, and we did a video survey of this, is people darting between the park and the country get across. Now when you start to consider that 30 to 40 percent of that community um, just along that corridor are actually 60 years and over, or is it 50? 50 years and over, 
you start to realize this isn't really a conducive environment to encourage people to walk. So we still have this to go back and try and uh, improve. And the problem with it is it's also a key traffic route, so it's very difficult to kind of do something uh, positive for pedestrians when it has a, a key traffic function as well. Um, Camberwell Road Corridor, again, it connects all the right places, schools, um, parks, <coughs> library, shops, etc. So why aren't there more people kind of walking along this corridor? Um, we looked at raised Ray side road crossings initially just through a study that was done in, in uh, London, uh, Transport for London, looked at side road crossings in terms of their benefits to pedestrians, this particular safety um, uh, side of it. We were still a little unconvinced, so we did some of our own digging around because we, we knew we had quite a, a, a few of these uh, very side road crossings that had been there for a while. And we had enough of them to actually go and look at those crash stats five years before and five years after they were introduced. And what we found is, and um, this is kind of an aggregate kind of number, but over 16 crossings, we had 11 crashes five years before they were introduced. Five years after, we, we only had two crashes at those locations. Um, what's also really evident is there's a change of behavior. Now, we, we want to quantify that. It's another piece of work we're trying to quantify that change of behavior at those locations. We know how we're going to do it. It's going to take a bit of time watching those videos. Um, but you can see that the behavior of motorists has changed. They've slowed. They're a bit more considerate. In a way, you've, you've introduced a very short area of shared space that provides a bit of uncertainty for drivers. So they're a bit more cautious. Then it's not their space completely anymore. And that has kind of changed the way the pedestrians use it and also changed the way that uh, motorists use that space. Trees, love trees. And uh, did a lot of digging on trees and we had a bit of a debate with Vic Rhodes. And I have to commend Vic Rhodes on their recent uh, tree planting policy because it actually talks about the benefit of trees and, and, and recognizes their value within the urban environment. Um, but they not only encourage physical activity, so if you want to encourage walking, get some trees in, also cycling they encourage, they also act as a, a traffic calming treatment. They actually bring speeds down. Um, traffic adjusts because it's, maybe it's a sense of enclosure, but for some reason they get a sense that there's something else going on here. Uh, but the battle we had with that was about clear zones and the fact that trees are Kind of considered um, crash risk because they're a, 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 an object that can be hit. Um, seating, we introduced seating along both these corridors. Uh, certainty of seating for all the people, people with and mobility is really quite important. In terms of spacing of seating, there's actually not a lot out there. It happens from person to person in terms of their mobility uh, needs. Uh, we also introduced wayfinding signs. There's even um, a heads up sort of map in here for children to get involved, so they get kind of uh, a representation of what's on top and there. But we picked up the real time bits of what's happening in the community. And the main reason we really did the wayfinding side of things was to inform people how close things were, how easy or short it was to walk there. These signs were put in the community. They know where the shops are. We don't need to point them to all the shops. But we do need to tell them that it's only a 15 minute walk. So these were more behavioral. Um, uh, there's more of a behavioral objective behind these signs in particular. Um, car share, we still haven't got these in yet. But um, within the rest of Bandara, where we've got car share in place, car share seems to promote walking. People state that they now walk more since they've joined the car share. So in terms of the behavioral change, um, what we wanted to do with this was really to encourage people to walk, but also to flag the infrastructure that was being delivered, um, to say, look, we're improving this environment because we really believe in walking and making an investment uh, and improving things for yourself. Um, the behavioral elements we're really keen <coughs> into was more around sort of fun and freedom, um, incentives, <coughs> Social norming, that figure of 15,000 people walking in and out of Camboy Junction, we use that as a headline to say, look, look at everyone working out there, this is what everyone's doing. 
Um, and then habits. Habits, we did that through a mobile uh, phone device, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But there were a set of design principles under those as well, and that was more to do with the messages we shaped. Things like the void being anti-color, but we still wanted to sort of pick out a little bit in terms of uh, driver frustrations. Um, social norm comes in there as well. But um, uh, you know, messages we've gone through is effect a small change. Just do a little change once once a week. Walk a little bit more. Uh, so the pilot round was along the Cookson Street corridor because we finished the, the infrastructure along that corridor first. So we developed a whole series of collateral and pamphlets, and we had a kind of a little bit of a party in the park and free coffee and um, um, all of those uh, cakes called. Um, Cupcakes, yeah. <laughs> um, and um, uh, we kind of um, advertised prizes. Uh, we created the orange sign there. We put those out in the community for the 12 <coughs> program. And um, you know, we had them at one telegraph poles uh, all over the place. Uh, only temporarily, because they only, they're only effective for a short period. But they kind of, um, uh, kind of gave the message of something going on and also provided the money. Um, the, the app we used at the time was Map My Walk, but it really didn't work very well. It was kind of clunky, you had to switch it on every time you wanted to go and log your, your, your walk. And uh, we, we didn't get a great take on that. Um, also our prizes, we focused a lot more on menu and discounts at shops, and that really didn't resonate with our community. We're not that interested in saving a little. But they were interested in health. Um, so in terms of the outcome, we found it hard to actually make people, people to kind of walk more. But we did get an increase along that corridor in terms of walking participation. Second round, we knew we needed to change things. We were focusing this time on the Campbell Road corridor. We just finished the infrastructure. Um, we needed to change the app. The app wasn't working for us at all. So we partnered with Cooper Grandmarts um, or Koopa, uh, and they have this app called Grandmarts. Runs in the background, really friendly to use. Um, we also focused far more on the health benefits of walking, um, and uh, we did keep a financial uh, component in there called a, a lottery of regret. And what this is, we pull a prize out of a hat, and we've got a name. If they log their walks um, that week, we give them a prize. If they don't. We pull another name out of the hat, and if that person's walked, they get the prize. But the email that goes out actually says then that who won it, but also who missed out on that prize because they hadn't walked that week. So that was the lottery we regret, and it seemed to resonate with people. And Grandma's app had all the gamification we wanted, and it had a fantastic leaderboard. Um, it's unbelievable how competitive people get with leaderboards. Um, forget health, give them a leaderboard, and they're out there walking trying to rack up their hearts. And um, you could see people jostling uh, for positions day after day, and it really worked. But it was an easy app to use. Once you'd switched it on, it kind of ran in the background, and it knew the difference between kind of one walk, standing around like this, or getting up and down, and actually going off and having a good walk. Uh, second time round, big change, big difference. We now have 500 people checking out our website, um, uh, a lot more people receiving emails, but we have 52 people regularly using um, the app and getting competitive with, with each other. Um, so in terms of how uh, kind of the outcome, um, again, I stress trying to design your evaluation from the onset, from the day one, thinking about how am I going to measure this? It's really important. And then if there's other opportunities for measuring things along the way, you can just add them to that as well. Um, so in the short term, uh, when we were actually running the behavior campaigns on these different corridors, uh, these were the increases. Now I've highlighted the ones in red because uh, really they're more reflective of the audience we were trying to change behavior with, the local community. So they're more likely to be walking around on Saturday, going to the shops, going for a coffee, etc. Whereas the, the kind of weekday ones, although they're still important, 
they're more of the people who, they're a mix of people, not just the community, but also people kind of, um, uh, uh, employed in the area. Um, we had a big 100% increase among Hanwha Road when we ran the campaign there. That's actually 1,100 extra people over a 12 hour period, uh, you know, on a weekday uh, period. And then on the Saturday, it was about 350 extra people. In the long term, the, the pilot program, the one on Hookson Street, in the weekday, that's kind of reverted back to where it was in base conditions. And that was the less successful kind of behavior initiative. But if you look at the weekend figure, the Saturday figure, that's still at, that's our local community is still working at a fair bit more than it is initially. Um, on the second round of behavior change, the try walking when we had some massive increases along Campbell Road, and we sustained a fair bit, a fair proportion of those big increases as well. Uh, we also went out to, uh, we also went out and we just went and we surveyed people, have you heard of the try walking program? 17% said they had, not great, but it's all right. Um, and, but a third of people said they now walked more than they did a year ago, and a third of people said they now left their car at home. Um, in terms of the map at the app, um, big difference. 750 kilometers walked in, uh, logged in a 12 week program with the pilot round. We had over 10,000 kilometers walked uh, in the second round, so we delighted. Um, we also emailed our questionnaires, uh, or emailed our tribe walking participants, and um, no surprises there. A lot of them said they now walk more than they do a year ago, and um, a good proportion kind of indicate they now drove less. <coughs> so, in summary, almost everyone is supported by walking councillors, community, engineers, everyone wants to support people walking. We understand, we underestimate, sorry, the, the scale and value of walking. As soon as you get out there and, and, and gather this information, you, you can actually see the scale of it. Uh, modeling and the surveys really helped focus the project in terms of where we can get the most bang for our buck, which corridors really need to be great. Uh, we learned a lot about behavior change. I didn't know a lot about it before I started this program. Um, the project, importantly, <coughs> demonstrated an increase in walking participation, and we had a clear change in behavior amongst those who were uh, part of the program. And just to leave you with um, uh, a little quote um, that we received, we received quite a few of these, but this is from Tish. I love listening to audiobooks while I walk. To me, Borondara has a hundred good books reflected in its parks and leafy streets. Thank you very much. Dan, thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so you mentioned uh, early on in your presentation that um, a lot of modeling you did didn't necessarily reflect the actual conditions. So can you kind of explain a little bit why that is? Like, what is that source of uh, error? Uh, there's no error. Um, it's the fact that GIS model is actually modeling population. So it's people living in that community. So um, you could say, well, it is representative if you think everyone's going to take walk every day at least once to the centre and back, but that's not the case. Um, but it gives you an idea of what the demand should be on those corridors if you compare them against each other. So if you then look at the number of people you've counted along each of those corridors, and you see, I've got a really big population out here, but we've got hardly anyone walking here, you kind of scratch your head and think, why, why is that? Does that need to be improved? Do we need to get people out of their cars? Do we need to address the safety issue along that corridor? Or is the lighting abysmal and no one walks there at night? So uh, it kind of sort of flags where there's a disparity. So for me, it was about latent de demand, identifying where there's a latent demand and an opportunity to increase the number of people walking. Next question, Chris. Yeah. Um, you've got some great outcomes, which are good. Do you have an idea about the cost effectiveness? So how much the whole thing costs? Yeah, um, there's a there's a heat um, software online. Um, World Health Organization have it online. Anyone can look it up, and you can put in a few parameters in terms of kind of different values you've got to choose. 
how much that project actually costs and what the change in walking uh, you got is. What we don't really know is how long each of those walking trips are. We've just got absolute numbers. So you have to make a guess that maybe those trips are 400 meters-ish on average, or you can be conservative. And then that'll spit out some numbers in terms of your be benefit cost ratios. And for these, they're up in the kind of dozens. I mean, some of the early ones are putting me at about BCR, about 30 to 1. And then when we put really conservative figures in there, we're still getting 15, 20 to 1 anyway. Hi, did you engage with your community in developing the plan from the beginning? And did you have some champions uh, you know, along the way to help identify how to get people walking or what are some of the motivational factors and what's very specific to that yeah. area? We did, um, we, we definitely did. Uh, I kind of haven't covered everything we did in the project because I'm trying to squeeze it into about 20 minutes. But um, we did we did, um, uh, we did workshops. We let the community know uh, in, in bulletins and we asked them for their opinions. We did surveys to find out what they do and how we could improve things. And we also did workshops where we had a small group of individuals and we walked along those corridors and asked them about those environments, how they feel, uh, as well as what improvements they'd like to see. Um, it's a bit of a challenging area because when we ask people in a questionnaire format, what would you like to see improved, it's very difficult to get any value out of it. Sometimes they'll say, oh, less, less built up development. And you've asked them a question about how can we improve walking for you. Um, or they'll say, oh, improve the car parking so I don't have to walk. You get some really obscure kind of feedback, and it's not always that valuable. And even when you're walking with them, and you're talking about how do you feel in the space, and what you enjoy about this space, and, and how can this be improved, um, there's actually quite limited, quite often people don't know how it can be improved. Sometimes they do. Um, like you do get things like, I find it difficult to cross the road at this point. But they can't recall how good the lighting is there until they're there at night, standing there, and they suddenly person the lighting is poor. Um, so it's actually quite challenging to get good uh, feedback from the community. And when people write in uh, about kind of how they'd like their walking environment um, improved, that's actually a bit of a rarity. Normally they just write in to uh, complain about something. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes. The path that you increased to 2.5 metres wide, did you find that cyclists started using it? Uh, well, look, occasionally there's a bike going down it, but um, the surveys we've done along Crookston Street have actually included bike movements, um, but all those bike movements seem to be occurring on the road. Okay. Um, it doesn't quite link up right um, for bikes, you still have trees kind of in the way and low branches, so it's substandard and there's posts right next to it. So we don't have a lot of problem with it beyond uh, what you normally see, you know, occasional bike user on, on a footpath somewhere. Hi, well, I know of one cyclist who uses it. Okay. Yeah, that is the whole line of this unfinished business, the roundabout. Yes. Um, not like the rest of the road laws in Australia, where pedestrians actually have right of way on a roundabout, they don't. Just yeah. interested to see what your opinion would be about that. Um, in terms of the law, um, the law is quite challenging in Australia at the moment. There's a lot of onus put on vulnerable road users and very little onus put on motorists. And I think there needs to be a better balance there. Uh, I think it might be a long way off before there's a lot of onus put on motorists, unfortunately. In terms of the road rules about roundabouts, roundabouts are challenging places for pedestrians. They are difficult. Um, they're convenient because pedestrians generally delay less at a roundabout than at a traffic signal because they go when there's an opportunity to go. Uh, and they, they, they know that. They're not breaking any road rules and they sort of dart across. But when you have roundabouts like that, huge challenge because the flow is ridiculous. Speed's not that much of an issue there. It's just finding the break in the, uh, that traffic. But you know, even watching how difficult it is to cross the road at that roundabout, there's motorists that understand that and they actually do 
slow and stop and let people through. Uh, we've got 12 hours of footage showing so many uh, motorists actually being considerate for people actually crossing there. So it's kind of interesting. We, we don't know what to do with it. We've, we've had discussions with Vic Road. We're going to raise it again and see where we can uh, uh, take, take that. We'll send you by signs on every direction. We're not coming in and out of a roundabout to force the path to slow down. Um, yeah. Take crossings for the other side. I think we've got a big topic there. We'll just yeah. grab about one or two more questions. We'll have to move on. Yeah, yeah I mean, but back. Yeah, hold on. That, that, that roundabout is, uh, is it's a, it's a problem for everyone on a cyclist. It's, a, it's a hopeless to try and cross there safely. Have you thought about using, say, a, a very low profile flat top speed hump there that isn't, that just because of its design and the, the edge and treatment, kind of looks like a pedestrian crossing but isn't? Uh, I, I might, it, it, they have. They are said to be very effective at actually slowing motors. Yeah, I might say that we've got lots of ideas for it, but in terms of something that can be agreed with um, with the crowds, that's that's probably the challenge. Um, it does have a, a traffic priority status under the Smart Roads uh, arrangement, um, but so it, it also is a priority bicycle uh, link as well. So it's about negotiation of what we can kind of change there uh, within uh, with our state partners, really. Um, uh, there's some great Scandinavian uh, examples of where you have a gentle road hump in, and then it smooths out kind of as you come out of that roundabout, and we have photos of that. But it, we just need to sort of gently, gently see if we can uh, uh, make some change there. Uh, but we haven't had, been able to get to any agreement so far. I'm, I'm very aware of Port Phillips kind of success with some of the treatments that they've done as well around roundabouts, having the crossing, um, uh, like the zebra crossing is right up next to the stop line, and that seems to be really successful in terms of crashes as well as the convenience of pedestrians. But it's a slightly different environment here because it is a priority traffic point. One final question, lady at the back. Um, I was just curious with the you mentioned in the surveys, 20% um, of people was said that they could have walk, walked. Was, were you just interested in the people who thought that they could walk, or did you also find out kind of, you know, the people who could have walked, it was a walkable distance, but they didn't actually even realise that it was, just because they're so used to driving, they didn't realise it was only a kilometre? Yeah, look, um, we, we just asked the simple question, could you have made that journey? today by walking and, and kept it at that. The reason being is distances people walk uh, or prepared to walk is very subjective in terms of personal experience, health um, and um, uh, the other thing is the, the trip purpose, whether they're going to the supermarket or not. It gets very complicated when you start to factor all those things so we kept it really simple. Could you have made your journey today by walking and used that as a measure? What you might note, though, is that that measure um, that takes our mode share up to 32%, um, that doesn't seem a lot compared to some of the increases in walking that we had along some of those corridors. So uh, it's kind of a mode share for the overall precinct rather than what you could affect in terms of change along a particular corridor can be very difficult, different and much higher. Thanks very much, Holt. Well, well, those are some good questions and good answers, so at least time to move on. Um, you mentioned surveys. Do a lot of surveys. Yes. We'll just do a very brief one here <laughs> relating to our program. We love surveys too.